again, if we can recite Surah Fatiha, ask Allah to dedicate the reward of the Surah to all of the Marhumin, those from our community, our family, and our friends who are no longer with us, the ulama, the scholars, the shuhada, those who have given their life around, around the world for the cows of Islam and for the ways of the Ahlul Bayt, Surah Mubarakatul Fatiha. لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم حسبنا الله ونعم الوكيل نعم المولى ونعم النصير فأعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والسيد المرسلين والشفيع المذنبين سيدنا ونبينا أبي القاسم محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد ثم الصلاة والسلام على أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين المنتجبين سيما بقية الله في الأرضين روحي وأرواح العالمين له الفداء ولانة دائمة على أعدائهم ومنكر فذائلهم من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين أما بعد رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقضة من لساني يفقه قولي صلوا على محمد وآل محمد اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد First off, it's great to be back home in Edmonton again tonight, and it's great to see so many familiar faces from the community again. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we begin this program tonight to first off accept our act of worship tonight and to give the thawab and to grant us the thawab of remembering one of the greatest martyrs in the cause of Islam. And truly the first individual who, although wasn't present in Karbala, we know that his Martyrdom came shortly before the tragic events of Karbala. However, still we consider Muslim ibn Aqil to be one of the first shuhada of this movement that say the shuhada started so many years ago and which continues until today. So although not present in Karbala, again he is the first martyr we can say and we ask Allah to accept our act of worship on this night and that we can benefit and we can understand greater the movement of Sayyid al-Shahada and the movement that Muslim ibn Aqil launched preceding the events of Karbala. One more salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Let me begin with this verse of the Quran in which I want to introduce this topic. And the topic which I want to look at tonight is called Follow the Leader. And you know, when we look at Islam and we look at the concept of leadership, I won't go into the temporal leadership, but rather in terms of a spiritual leadership. We see that, and this is just one portion of the discussion, but if you look at this verse of the Quran, but actually, if, if, and I didn't present it on the PowerPoint tonight, but the verse which precedes this one, chapter number four, verse 58, is a verse where Allah actually lays down the requirement for how a leader should be. So again, I don't want to look at it from the temporal leadership in terms of our communities, our governments, our countries, but rather in terms of spiritual leadership tonight. When Allah introduces this topic of leadership of the imams, of the prophets, of the uh, representatives of Allah upon the earth, he first addresses the leaders. So not the people who are being led, but the actual people who are in charge of the society, the, the, the spiritual leaders. And the one criteria that Allah says when he talks about leadership, he tells the prophet, he tells the imams, he tells the spiritual leaders of a community, he says that when you are charged with leadership, when you are charged with the spiritual guidance or the guidance of a community, Allah says that judge and guide the people using adl, using justice. It's obviously a, a given that a leader, whether again he be of a temporal nature or of a spiritual nature, has to guide with this aspect of a justice within his life, within his life and within his rule. And once Allah talks about that very brief, very one brief sentence in the Quran of the leaders using justice, he then points to this particular verse of the Quran from Surah Nisa, verse number 59. And this is a very famous verse that we've heard many times. Many of the scholars and the writers and thinkers refer to this verse when they talk about the leadership of the Ahlul Bayt of the 12 Imams in particular. And this verse again forms one of the most important 
discussions within Islam, which is again about the leadership of the Prophet and the Ahlul Bayt As the verse says, Allah addresses the believers, says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu. So Allah is addressing you and I directly, the believers, in this particular verse. He says, Atiyu Allah wa atiyu Rasul wa ulul amri minkum. He first off says, Obey Allah. Allah Himself telling us to obey Allah and follow the commandments of Allah. And then he repeats the order to obey. He says, وَأَتِيُوا رَسُولُ وَأُولِ الْأَمْرِ مِنْكُمْ And obey the Prophet and those who are given authority from amongst you. Now this entire discussion, if I were to go into the semantics of this verse and how it has played out through history, we would be here for much longer than any of us, I think, want to be here tonight. So I won't go into the entire discussion of how the ulama have broken down this verse. But it is interesting to see that Allah repeats the word atiyu, to obey, for Allah and then the Prophet. So he doesn't say obey Allah, the Prophet, and those in authority. He says obey Allah, obey the Prophet, and those in authority amongst you. And this at the first level shows us that Allah is the supreme leader. Allah is the supreme judge, the supreme head of, of humanity. But that he gives his authority to certain individuals. And that's why he says, obey Allah and obey the messenger. So when we obey the messenger, we do so with the understanding that we obey the prophets of God based upon the fact that Allah has told us to obey them. And then Allah says, not only obey the messenger, but ulul amri minkum, and those who are given authority from amongst you. And this shows us from one point of view that the obedience to the ulul amr, those who are in authority, is at the same level as obedience to the Prophet. Meaning that if the Prophet puts 12 individuals in charge of a community, then to follow those 12 individuals is equivalent to following the Messenger of Allah. And following those 13 individuals is equivalent to following Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But also we understand that, we can, and we can take this a step further, which is that if those 12 Imams, those 12 leaders which are appointed by Allah, or rather by the Prophet, and he is in turn appointed by Allah, if those 12 Imams appoint individuals as rulers or authorities, then their obedience also becomes an, an, an obligation upon us based upon the fact that we are obligated to follow those 12 Imams. And then the end of the verse says that if you have any dispute, if you have any argument amongst one another, then return that back to Allah and to the Messenger. Tonight we've gathered together to, re to remember the shahadat of Muslim ibn Aqil. And again, as I mentioned in the beginning, that he is a very important individual within the history of not only the faith of Ahlul Bayt, but also Islam in general. Briefly, who was Muslim ibn Aqil? We know that he was a son of Aqil ibn Abi Talib. Aqil was the brother of Imam Ali alayhi salam, which means that he was the nephew of Amir al-Mu'mineen, and he was the first cousin of Imam Hassan and Imam Hussein alayhi salam, also with, uh, with other members of the family. So he had a very close family bond to the Ahlul Bayt, being directly from this tree, this pure and blessed tree of, the, of, of, uh, of, of Nubuat and Imamat. So he had a close relationship in terms of his family. He had a very close and a very... A direct connection to the Ahlul Bayt because of the upbringing, because obviously in those times, and even we see it in today's day and age, that the extended families tend to, you know, be close to one another. You'll have nephews, you'll have cousins, uncles and aunts who are, you know, if they're within the same city, they share that, that same bond, they're together, may, you know, may, they may play together, they may go to the mosque together. So there was a strong relationship and a strong family bond amongst all these individuals. And the reason I mention this is because when that time came for Sayyid al-Shuhada to make that journey from his home in Medina towards Karbala, towards his eventual martyrdom, before that even occurred, and I'll, I'll look at that at the end, but before that movement occurred for Sayyid al-Shuhada to go from Medina to Mecca and then change his Hajj from the Hajj to the Umrah and make it to Karbala, he was put into a situation where the people of Kufa were looking for him to come and basically take control of the society. They had gone through many different challenges. They had obviously the, the wilayat, they had the, the imamat of Amir al-Mu'mineen for many years until he was killed. And then there were so many different issues that came up in the community. And finally the people of Kufa 
tired of the situation that was afflicting them because of the, you know, the, the governors who were ruling under the Bani Umayyah, whether it be under the leadership of Muawiyah or his son, the cursed Yazid, that they were really tired of the situation. And that's why they actually asked Sayyid al-Shuhada through sending letters and emissaries. And again, some of the traditions actually mention that over 10,000 letters were sent to Sayyid al-Shuhada for him to come to Kufa. Not 10,000 people who wrote 10,000 letters, but rather some of these letters were from tribes of 10, 20, 50, 100 people. So one letter may have been signed by 100 different people. So it wasn't just 10,000 individuals or heads who were inviting Sayyid al-Shuhada. It could have been hundreds of thousands of people who were calling Imam Hussein towards Kufa to become the leader and the, the head of the state. But obviously Imam he wasn't able to just go on his own, and even in today's politics and diplomacy, we know that governments don't necessarily deal directly with another foreign government. They'll have their ambassadors in a certain country, and the ambassador will carry the wishes of that country to the host country. A government may send the vice president or the secretary of state or somebody of influence within the government to speak to the other party. We'll say the shohada was no different. When he was making this movement from Medina to Mecca, and then from Mecca, obviously, eventually to Karbala, he sent the most trusted individual that he had, again, and this being Muslim Ibn Aqil. So not only was he a family member, but he was a trusted individual. It wasn't just because they were family, so he involved nepotism in this issue, but no, he had the trust, he had the conviction that Muslim Ibn Aqil would be the right person to carry the message of Imam Hussein towards the people of Kufa. Salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. And therefore, when Imam Hussein sent Muslim, he sent him with this message. He says that I'm sending my cousin and one of the most trustworthy and most trusted individuals from my family to report to me about the affairs of the people of Kufa. Imam says that if he agrees and if he sees the situation on the ground is conducive, then I will come and I will help in this movement. And if he sees that anything else is happening, he'll report back to me. So Imam knew that he would be the one, Muslim ibn Aqil would be the one to judge the situation on the ground, look at what was happening, and then from there he would basically report back to Imam Hussein whether he should make his way to Kufa or whether he should stay and decide another route to take within his life and within this movement. So based upon this introduction, what I want to look at tonight very briefly is this issue of following the leader. Again, keeping in mind that we're looking at a spiritual leadership of the community, not necessarily a, a, you know, a global or, a, or a, a leadership in terms of politics and, and governance in terms of the world that we live in, but in terms of our spiritual leadership that we have within our tradition. And for this, I want to focus on a hadith we have from our 8th Imam, Imam Ali ibn Musa al-Radha, alayhi salatu was salam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa Ali Muhammad in which he basically had a companion come to him named Ibn Jaham. And Ibn Jaham had asked the Imam a very simple question. He was looking at how to identify himself as being a follower of the Ahlul Bayt. It's a very simple question, maybe it's something which comes up into our minds sometimes that how do we know that we actually are, are followers of the Prophet and his noble family? You know, it's not like we have a membership card in our wallet or our purse that says I'm a member of the Ahlul Bayt and it's signed by the Imam or a stamp of the Imam. We don't have that concept. We don't have this, you know, belief as some religions have and even groups within Islam that you can write a letter to an individual as a, as a religious leader of the community and verify their Iman or verify their faith in the religion. So we have to see how is it that you and I can understand if we're actually true followers of the true leaders, which again are the Prophet, his daughter Fatima Zahra, and the 12 Imams from the Ahlul Bayt. So this companion, Ibn Jaham, he goes to the 8th Imam, and he asks the 8th Imam a very simple question. He says to the Imam, he says, Ju'iltu fadak, he says, may I be sacrificed for you, O Imam? He says, Ashtaha an a'lama kayfa ana indak. He says, how do I know what you think of me? What is my status with you, the Ahlul Bayt? Right? It's one thing for you and I to say that we follow the Ahlul Bayt. And inshallah, all of us follow them as being the guides to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, as we read in Ziyarat al-Jamiyah, one of the most comprehensive ziyarat that we have to address any of our imams, 
when we call the 12 when we call the 12 imams in the ziyarat we say that you are the guides to Allah adillah ala Allah that you are the guides who will lead us to Allah that you are the signposts to guide us towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so we all claim to be the followers of imams we all claim to be the followers of the ahlul bayt but we have to flip it around and look at how the imam replies to him that it's not only enough for you and I to claim membership into this club of Islam and to be claimed to be the followers of the imams, but we have to look at it at a deeper level to see what it is that the imam is looking from us. Just as Muslim ibn Aqil, he could have just claimed to be a Shia of Imam Hussein. He could have said, oh Imam, I'm your Shia, I'm your follower, I'm ready to do whatever you want me to do. And then if, God forbid, if Imam Hussein had asked him as he did to go towards Kufa and see this situation, what if Muslim ibn Aqil had said, well, you know, I have a family to take care of, I have a wife and children, I don't have the ability, I can't leave town right now, or I can't give my time up to you, but I still claim to be your follower, but I just don't have the time. Obviously, we wouldn't be here tonight marking his wafat, his shahadat rather, right? So we have to see that what he had within him, which is that loyalty to the imam, how is it that we ourselves can understand if we're at that level of loyalty, to our Imam, and that is our living Imam of the age, Imam Sahab al Asri wa Akhir al Zaman. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. <coughs> so Ibn Jaham asks the Imam, What do you, you know, how do I know that I am with you? How do I know that you're accepting me as your follower? And the Imam replies to him, He says, Undur kaifa ana indak. He says, If you want to know if you're accepted as a follower of the Ahlul Bayt, if you want to know, are you within our camp, within our army, within our ranks? He says, look into your spiritual heart and see what my status is, is with you. If we want to know, are we in the camp of the Imam? We don't have that ID card again, right? We don't have any email or text message from the Imam that says we follow him or that we, that we are in his army. The Imam is saying that if you want to know that if, if, if what, in what situation you're in with, you, with, you know, with the Imams, he says, look into your spiritual heart and determine what our status is with you. Meaning that if we love the Imam more, if we are ready to sacrifice, whether it be our wealth, our time, our possessions, our, our whatever it is that we have that we consider dear, if we're look at that level, to, to give anything up in the way of the Ahlul Bayt, then we should know that we are with the Imam and that they are actually considering us as their followers. Salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. Therefore, it's easy for us to claim to Allah or to claim to the Prophet or the Ahlul Bayt that we are their followers. It's easy to say when somebody asks me, what religion do you follow? I say, well, I'm a Muslim. And then they may say, well, there's many different shades of Muslims out there. You have Muslims of every, you know, ideology of religious group. Well, what group did you fall into? And, you know, because the media nowadays, they put us, you know, as Shias and Sunnis, they try to compartmentalize us and put us into different groups and segments. They'll ask us, well, okay, you're a Muslim, but what kind of a Muslim are you? Are you one of those radical fundamentalist Wahhabis that you hear about so much in the media? We say, no, no, we, we're not with them. They say, well, what group do you fall into? Because again, these names are so common nowadays in the media, just like you hear Catholic, Protestant, and the different you know, versions and flavors of Christianity. We say, well, we're followers of, of the Ahlul Bayt. We are belongers of the, the, the nation known as the Shias. So we ourselves claim that identity as Shias. It's easy for us to claim that. However, the question which we want to ask tonight is that, if the Ahlul Bayt were present right in front of us right now, would they actually accept our statement that yes, we are your Shias? Would they accept us as their Shias? That's a question we have to ask ourselves as we look at the life of Muslim Ibn Aqil. And in order for us to look at ourselves, and this is a, a night that we should do some self-introspection, to look at ourselves and see, are we the true Shias? You know, because Allah says in the Quran, بَلِ الْإِنسَانُ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا he says, it's not, recommend, it's not required for Allah to pinpoint each and every one of us, even, even on the Day of Judgment. If there was no Day of Judgment, if there was no opening of our Book of Actions, if there was no Allah as the judge, the jury, and the executioner on the Day of Judgment, 
Allah says, Balil insanu ala nafsihi basira. That you and I could judge for ourselves whether we should go to heaven or go to hell. Whether we're destined for paradise or the hellfire, we don't need Allah to tell us that. Each of us, even in this room tonight, could sit down and look at what we've done in our life and judge if Allah were to judge me according to my actions. Forget about His mercy and His compassion and His rahmat, which is there. I don't doubt that. But if we were to ask ourselves tonight, would Allah have sent me to heaven or to hell? The question or the answer to that question is clear because Allah says, Balil insanu ala nafsihi basira. Each of us knows where we should be going. We don't need Allah to tell us, we don't need the Imams or the Prophet to tell us, we ourselves know. So what we wanted to look at briefly tonight are some characteristics that are present within the Shias or how the Imams have defined how we should be. And we look at these to see that are we within the category of fitting within those individuals who are referred to as the Shias of the Prophet and the family of the Prophet. There's a very interesting book which is written by one of our great scholars named Sheikh Saduq. Sheikh Saduq, for those who have never heard of him, he was actually born through the du'as of our 12th Imam. His father and mother couldn't conceive a child, and so he was, his father was, his parents lived during the time of the major occultation, or rather the minor occultation, and they couldn't conceive. So the story is, is that the father had written a letter to the Imam, and he asked him to basically make a du'a to Allah that, he, that they are able to conceive a child. So the historians narrate that shortly thereafter, Sheikh Saduq was born. So him being a contemporary of that era, and one who again was born through the blessings of our 12th Imam, he, in addition to writing many different books that are even used today within the, within the scholarship of Islam, he has one book called Al-Mawaid. Al-Mawaid meaning the discourses, the the, the exhortations. And within this book, he's got two separate chapters called Fadail al-Shia and Sifat al-Shia. Fadail meaning the characteristics, the noble qualities of the Shias, the greatness of the Shia. And the other chapter is Sifat al-Shia, the traits and the characteristics of what makes a person a Shia of the Prophet, a follower of the Prophet. So he quotes many different hadith in this book about what it takes to be considered as a true Shia of the Prophet. I just want to look at two of these hadith tonight. The one of them which I, I want to look at first is the morality of the rich Shia within the community. Now I put the word rich in quotation marks because richness is one of those words within English which is, you know, it's a, it's, it's a word which has many different meanings. It, it depends on how you compare it to another thing because you can say this person is rich, but how do you compare that? You have to compare it to somebody who has nothing or who has very little. Right, So rich is only understood when you look at poor, just as young is only understood when you look at old. Black is only understood by knowing white. Darkness is only understood by knowing light. So there are contrasts, but you have to know the opposite before you can understand, obviously, the, the actual meaning of that word. So when we look at rich, we don't mean perhaps multimillionaires or billionaires within the communities. You know, looking at a man like uh, Bill Gates, for example, he may be considered rich, but somebody maybe, let's say, like the late Steve Jobs, he would be considered richer than him. So Steve Jobs is maybe rich because he's a billionaire, but Bill Gates is poor compared to Steve Jobs if, if, if you're looking at a monetary value of their wealth, right? So rich is very, it's, it's a term which is difficult to, to understand. But definitely most of us in this room tonight, and most of us in Canada, without a doubt, are richer than a family living in Bangladesh, let's say in, in, in a slum in Bangladesh. Many of us in this room are much richer than our family and friends, let's say back in East Africa, who may only be making a few hundred dollars a week or a few hundred dollars a month. You know, even the poorest of people in Canada is rich compared to them. But rather than going through all the semantics, let me just look at this hadith and see how the Imam defines or what he looks at as a quality for the quote-unquote rich people from within the community. Again, not rich in the terms of millions or billions, but more than what other people perhaps have within our society. So Imam Sadiq al Islam, our sixth Imam, he asks one of his companions, they're having a discussion one day with the sixth Imam, and the sixth Imam is you know, asking him, well, you know, the situation of our Shias, how are they, how are they doing? What traits do they have? What do you see within the qualities of the people that you claim are our Shias? So they're discussing back and forth different issues. 
And the first thing the Imam asks him, he says that, you know, you keep talking about the Shias, the Shias, that they're like this, they're like that, they're like this, they have all these traits. He says, tell me about the rich, and they're visiting the poor. Not helping the poor, but just visiting the poor. Right? So how do the rich people interact with the poor people of the society? How do they, you know, whether it be in, in a majalis, in a gathering like this, or maybe when they're sick, or if there's a majlis at somebody's house, how do the rich people interact with these kinds of people? And let me just, you know, divert for one second, give you this one story of the time of the Prophet. There's an event in the masjid of the Prophet, when the Prophet was in Medina, and he was sitting in the masjid, and a rich person or a few rich people were maybe around the Prophet or against, you know, one of the pillars in the mosque, and a poor person or relatively poor individual comes into the masjid and he sits down beside one of these quote-unquote rich people. And immediately that rich man takes his clothing and gathers it up because he didn't want the, the poor man to touch his clothing. And the prophet saw this and the prophet was just flabbergasted. You know, he addresses the man and, he, and, 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 and a conversation ensues. And the Prophet says, are you scared of this poor person that by him touching you, that you were going to lose some of your wealth? You know, or, or, or what, what's the problem here? Why did you change when this poor man sat beside you? And immediately that man, that rich man realized that what he'd done was wrong, that he earned the censorship of the Prophet, that the Prophet actually had to censure him and, and you know, show him that he was wrong in what he did. And it's interesting because then that rich man, he did tawbah, he did istighfar, he apologized to that, to that poor person. And he, as a way of his penitence, as a way of repenting for what he did, he says, I want to give you half of my wealth. Here's my income, take half of my, my, whatever my savings or whatever I'm worth. The poor man made an interesting statement. He says that, nice offer, thank you very much, I accept your forgiveness, but I fear that if I take your money, that one day I become just like you. Just to have that arrogance that, you know, I don't even want to sit beside a poor person or even touch a person who is poor. Right. So here the Imam says that, tell me about our Shias. Do they visit the poor? Do they sit with them? Do they talk with them? The, imam, the, the man replies to the Imam, he says, Khalil, he says, very few of the rich Shias do this. Right? Very few of our, our Shias, or, or those people who you claim to be our followers, very few engage in this. They don't deal with the poor people. They don't talk to these people in society. You know, they're, the low, they're the lower class people. They're of the lower caste, the lower status. So the Imam says, okay, fine, they don't visit them. That's not a problem. He says, how about the rich people thinking about the poor people? Fine, don't go to their house. But he says, well, what about in their thoughts? Do they even think about the people who are poor? And if they think, do they even give their charity? You know, they don't have to give it to the poor man in their hand, but they can go and give it to an organization or an institution, and then that will be channeled to that poor person. So do they think about the poor? Do they help the poor in any way? The man replies, he says that... Uh, he says, you're talking about morals and etiquette, which we don't see within our Shias. You know, forget about visiting the poor. The Imam says, they don't even, the, the man says, we don't even think about the poor. They don't even think about the lower class people in society, the apparently lower class. We don't even think about them. They don't even help the poor people in the society. The Imam replies to him, he says, if that's the case, if they don't visit the poor, they don't think about the poor, they don't help the poor, he says, then how do you think that you people are our Shias? How do you think that you can be called the followers of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad? Salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. It's something to think about. Well, we have this pride in ourselves that we're Shias of, of the Prophet and the Shias of Ali. But yet the Imam says in this hadith, he says that not even thinking about the poor within a society, especially the, the poor people of the followers of Ahlul Bayt, he says that you don't even deserve the title of a Shia, of the, of, of the family of the Prophet. You know, forget about visiting the people and going to their homes, even thinking about them. The Imam says that if you're not at that level, that you're not even classified as one of our followers. Again, it's, it's one thing for you and I to claim that status of a Shia, but we reciprocate and we flip that around and see does the Imam consider us to be a Shia. If we don't have this one trait within us, then we risk the loss of not being classified as one of the Shias of the, of the family of the Prophet. The second hadith which I want to look at looks at another trait of what a Shia has to have. 
And again, it looks at the Imam looking at all of the people, and all of the Shias rather, and, and their characteristics and their qualities and what they have within them. And this hadith, one of the Imams has narrated, there was uh, no direct reference to one of the Imams that I could find. So it's narrated from one of the Imams that the Imam had state, made this statement. He said in regards to his Shias, he says that some of you as my Shias perform more Salat than other people. Right? Many people perform, the, obviously the, the, the Wajib Salat is one thing, but the Mustahab Salat, many people will wake up for Salat to lay at night, they'll perform in month of Ramadan the thousand rakat. They'll perform all the mustahab recommended prayers. So Imam says, there's some of you ba'dukum akthara salat min ba'd. Some of you Shias perform many more salat than others. Again, a very good deed to perform recommended prayers. And the Imam isn't reprimanding people for it. He's just saying that many of you perform many more prayers than others perform. He says, some of you perform many more hajj than other people. Right? We have some people who only have the tawfiq to go for hajj once in their life. And then other times you have people year after year, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years they make the Hajj. Maybe they take a group or they're going on their own because they have the financial means. Again, there's nothing wrong with that action. The Imam is just saying many of those some Shias who go for Hajj much more often than other people who don't have the ability, whether it be because of time constraints or financial constraints, whatever the case may be. But some just don't have that ability. So he says many people, many of you guys go for Hajj more than other people. Then he says, many of you give more sadaqah, more charity than others. Again, it's not a matter of quantity, but it's, it's also the quality. But he says that many of you give more charity than other people do. And he says, many of you fast more than others. And again, all of these are very good actions to pray, to fast, to go for hajj, to give in charity. All of these things are recommended actions. But they're not the cake. They're not the, you know, the icing on that cake. It's easy for a person to, it's relatively easy for a person to pray. It's easy to fast. It's even easy to go for Hajj in today's day and age with LRTs and subways going between Mecca and Arafat and air conditioning and, you know, all the comforts that, that, the, that the, 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 uh, the establishment in Saudi Arabia has put for the Hujjaj. So all of these things make the acts easy and they're relatively easy things to do. But what the Imam is showing is that don't rely on these characteristics to judge who is a true Shia of the, of the family of the Prophet. And at the end he says, Afdalukum, Afdalu ma'rifat. He says, the best of you are not those who perform many prayers. It's not those who go for Hajj on a regular basis. It's not those who give charity and huge amounts of charity. It's not those who you know, fast in, for the entire year, except for those days which is obviously haram. He says, the best of you are those who have the best level of knowledge of ma'rifat. Unfortunately, this is one of the things which lacks in many of our communities is knowledge of the religion. Again, we, we, you know, alhamdulillah, we spend millions of dollars and probably billions as a community on further education, going to the best universities to get the you know, best degrees, to get the, you know, the, the best job. And these are all, again, very important things. You know, we can never underestimate the importance of our community, of our youth, the boys and the girls, of going to university, of going to college, of getting a good degree of having a profession that they can be proud of, to earn money, to support their families, to build up these communities. And we look at it, we spend so much money and resources on secular education, on, on you know, the studies of the world to benefit us. But when it comes to religious knowledge, we don't have that same interest and desire. You know, we don't have that even wish to open up a book. And even today, we, we don't even have to buy the books. We just go onto Google and we Google a book and we can read the whole book online. So we don't even have to pay for that knowledge. A lot of it is freely available thanks to the internet. So we have so many sources available. We have books, we have articles, we have satellite stations that are, are, that are just popping up everywhere around the world. We have so many ways to gain knowledge of Islam. And this is what the Imam shows us. He shows us that it's not important to pray for much and to fast profusely and to give much charity. He says, the best of you are those who have the best and the most knowledge of the religion. Looking at the hadith of, of knowledge, just for one or two minutes and we'll conclude, that the Prophet, you know, even if you look at nothing except for the very first verses that came to the Prophet, the very initial ayat that were revealed to the Prophet in the cave of Hira, the very first word that comes to the Prophet after the, after the Bismillah is Ikra, read. What other religion we can find in the world today that promotes reading 
and literacy as almost an obligation within the religion. You know, when other religions and traditions, for example, if you read the Old Testament, you'll see how God, apparently in the Bible, actually calls knowledge and, you know, and, and, and this awareness of the world to be a curse that he didn't want humanity to have. Refer to the Bible, the story of Adam and Eve, and when God tells Adam and Eve, don't go near that tree, because that is the tree of knowledge. And while you eat from that tree, you'll know between good and bad. The Christian church, I mean from the Bible, not what the Christians say today, but the Bible looks at knowledge as being almost evil in one perspective. You know, because, because the Bible says that when Adam was told not to eat from that tree, he says that that is the tree of knowledge. Right? So... Contrast that with the very first words that come to our prophet, which is to read. We see that there's a stark difference between these two traditions. And in fact, when the prophet was uh, implementing Islam in, in, in Medina, one of the things that was uh, one of the rules was that if there was ever a war and the Muslims captured soldiers, the one way that that soldier could be freed is not to pay money, is not to pay the ransom or to, you know, uh, give any kind of money, but he says, you as a prisoner, a non-Muslim prisoner, you teach 10 Muslims how to read and write, and you're free, right? So they had no Geneva Convention, they had no rules of engagement at that time, but the Prophet said, your freedom can be bought by teaching a Muslim how to read and write. The Prophet said, and we've heard these hadith many, many, many times, seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, right? Seek knowledge is an obligation, seeking knowledge is an obligation, even if you have to travel to China. Prophet says, you know, utlubul ilm, that seeking knowledge is an obligation upon the man and the, mo and the woman. He didn't discriminate and say only men can learn. He didn't say only men should go to the religious seminaries. He didn't say only men can go to universities. He made knowledge not the, you know, the, the property of a particular individual or a particular gender. He opened up knowledge for everybody, whether it be a Muslim, a non-Muslim. You know, he even said, for example, that al-hikmat, that wisdom is the lost treasure of a believer. So if you can find it from a non-believer, he says, take it from them. Right? So we have no problem as Muslims going to Western universities and, and learning education, taking in that knowledge, whether it comes from a Muslim or a non-Muslim. The Prophet gave us that ability or that, that right to seek knowledge from wherever it may be. And again, as the sixth Imam mentions, or rather as one of the Imams mentions in this hadith, that when it comes to having that ID card as being a true Shia, he says, don't look at that person and they're praying and they're fasting and their acts of worship, but look at their level of knowledge. If they don't have the knowledge, if they don't have the knowledge of the religion, if they don't know why they're praying, what benefit is it to pray? Right? If we don't know why we, for example, fast in the month of Ramadan, yes, we'll still get the reward for it, but if we don't know why we fast, or we don't know why we pray, we don't know why we do these acts of worship, we've lost out on a huge part of the reward of that particular act of worship. And one of the ways that we realize this, you know, that, that we don't have that knowledge is if people come to us. Because, you know, if we're within our own community, we might not get asked this question. But if we go to work and we work with non-Muslims, or we go to school with non-Muslims, and they say, well, you know, you guys are in Mecca right now, two million people, what is this act of the Hajj? Why do you go around the Kaaba seven times? Why do you do this action? Why do you do this thing? And we just say, well, I don't know. I do it just because, you know, my mom and dad do it. And my mom and dad told me to do it because I was born as a Muslim. So I have to follow them. It's an insult to ourselves, an embarrassment to ourselves if we don't know why we do a particular act of worship. Now, I'm not saying that we all go to the Hausa and study, but we need to develop and further advance our knowledge on Islam by knowing why we do certain acts of worship. Why is it, for example, that, you know, we fast in the month of Ramadan, what is the philosophy behind it? Is it just that we feel hungry and it's a good weight loss and it's a good detox program that our naturopathic doctor suggested for us to do? Or is there a wisdom behind it? You know, when we have these questions that come up, um, up into our mind, we need to have an answer for them, not only for those outside of our religion who may ask us, but also for ourselves to be able to better appreciate the wisdom of the teachings of the faith of Islam. Salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad. And without a doubt, when you look at these sifat and these traits of the Shias and what it means to be a true follower of the Ahlul Bayt, we could probably perhaps find no other individual such as Muslim ibn Aqil within the history of the 
the history, at least of the early history of Islam. Muslim, as we mentioned in the beginning, was a close family member of the Ahlul Bayt, but he was also a close follower. And there's also obviously a very big difference between being a friend and a family member and being a follower. Many people were family members of various prophets, but how many were followers? Prophet Noah, his own son, left the religion, became a disbeliever. Many people at the time of our prophets also, who were within a greater family circle, were not classified as true followers of our prophet. But Muslim ibn Aqil was unique because not only was he a family member, but he was a loyal and dedicated family member to the family of the Prophet. We're told in the books of history when we look at the life and the, the death of Muslim ibn Aqil that once Imam Hussein had made that intention to go towards Kufa and he had sent Muslim ibn Aqil, he told Muslim to gauge the situation in Kufa. If you see that it's conducive for me to go and begin this revolution, he says then write me a letter and, 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 and let me know what the situation is. We're told in the books of history that when Muslim ibn Aqil finally reached the city of Kufa, that there had already been some murmurs of this movement beginning. One of the very first people that Muslim met was actually Mukhtar ibn Abu Ubaid al Thaqafi, the famous Mukhtar who I'm sure we've seen the movie about, we've read much about. He went to Mukhtar's house and they obviously were discussing. We don't know what the discussion was, but we know that obviously something had been planned between these individuals. From there, Muslim went to other known supporters of the family of the Prophet, Hani ibn Urwa being another prominent companion of the Imam whom Muslim had also gone to. But as this movement began to gather and, and gain speed and momentum, and hundreds if not thousands of people began to support Muslim ibn Aqil, the government obviously heard that there was something happening. And the governor at that time, Nu'man ibn Bashir, he was an individual who was obviously appointed by Yazid to be in that position, appointed by the Bani Umayyah to be the governor of Kufa. But they say that he wasn't that stern and that powerful and that you know, commanding in his presence. And therefore he brushed aside a lot of these movements and the movement that was taking place. And because of this, they were told that the people were telling Yazid that you, know, you, know, you have to appoint somebody who can rule with a firm grip, with an iron fist. And therefore, the cursed Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad Mal'un was sent to Kufa. And basically from there is where the, the situation got much worse and, 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 and as days transpired, it got much more difficult for Muslim to, again, to recruit individuals to work for the cause. We're told that as this movement began to gain steam, that Muslim at one time, he was in the Masjid of Kufa and he had begun his Salatul Jamaat. Narrations give us figures of hundreds up to the thousands of people that were praying behind him in Masjid of Kufa. And we're told that as the Salat continued and the prayers continued, that one by one the people were leaving the center, were leaving the masjid, until a point came where he turns around and some hadith narrate there was just a handful of people, if not even just one person in the masjid. Imagine a time when 10,000 letters had come to Imam Hussein. Those 10,000 letters translate to maybe 100,000 people. That now the, the, the representative of the Imam of their time is asking them for assistance and just a handful of people are left. Whatever the case may be, Muslim ibn Aqil begins to leave Masjid al-Kufa walking through the barren streets of the city of Kufa. And he finally comes to a house of an old woman. He sits at the door of the house and she opens up the door and she sees this man. Her name is Taua. She's an old woman by this time. And she sees Muslim ibn Aqil and she begins to talk to him. She says that, who are you? And he says, don't ask me who I am. I'm just a stranger walking the streets of Kufa. She continues to persist and ask him, who are you? Who are you? And then finally he says, I've come from the city of Medina. And she says, my master is in Medina. My master Hussein is in the city of Medina. Muslim ibn Aqil tells her, not only is he your master, but he's also my master. He's my imam. He's my relative. And he sent me here to, to gauge the situation of the Shias of the city of Kufa. Are they ready to begin this movement against the government of Bani Umayyah? She quickly tells him to come in the house because she knows the situation in Kufa is such that he won't, really, he won't live if another minute was he to stay in the streets. He comes into the house and he, be, he takes a spot within the house. Unfortunately, this woman, Tawa, her son Bilal, Although she, he is brought up in the house of such a woman that she's a lover of the Ahlul Bayt, however, unfortunately, he's gone to the dark side. He's one of those individuals who has left the ways of Ahlul Bayt and has sold his soul to the Bani Umayyah. He finds out that evening that Muslim ibn Aqil is within his house and he makes that quick dash to the, to the palace. 
He tells the guards that I have news that Muslim Ibn Aqil, who you've been looking for for the last few days, he's in my mother's house. That next morning we're told that the, that the guards of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad begin to circle the house of Tawa. Tawa, is, she informed Muslim ibn Aqil that these guards are outside. Muslim ibn Aqil, not wanting to cause any harm to this old woman, he comes out of the house. We're told that he picks up his sword and he begins to fight against the enemies, one after the other. Him being from the family of Ali ibn Abi Talib, being from that family of warriors, he begins to fight and he begins to kill soldier after soldier. People begin to throw rocks at him. People begin to throw sticks of fire at him. Somebody is on the roof throwing bales of hay which are on fire at Muslim ibn Aqil. Finally, a point comes, brothers and sisters, when Muslim ibn Aqil cannot can take it no longer. The blows against his body are too severe. They drag him to the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They drag him to the palace and they begin the verdict against him. They say that you have risen up against the Khalifa of God. You have risen again against the ruler of this community and your punishment is nothing but death. He says that yes, you can kill me, but give me one last will. He says, give me the ability to give my will to somebody. They bring Umar ibn Sa'ad close to him, who were, they were related, and Umar ibn Sa'ad is given the will. Muslim ibn Aqil tells him, just give me three things, let me do three things. He says, when I die, he says, bear, he says, sell my shield and my sword and pay off the debt that I have. He says, the second thing is when you kill me, he says, at least give my body the proper ghusl and the proper burial. And he says, number three is take a message to my master Hussein, who is in, in the city of Mecca. He says, tell him that the people of Kufa are not loyal, just as they weren't loyal to my father, Imam Ali. Just as they weren't for, for loyal to my master, Ali, he said, they're not loyal to Imam Hussein. Tell Imam Hussein not to go to Kufa. He takes, Umar ibn Sa'ad takes his message back to Ubaidullah. Ubaidullah says, yes, we will sell his short sword and shield and we'll pay off his debt. But for the other two things, we won't listen to, to Muslim ibn Aqil. We're told that they bring him close to the edge of the palace, or on the roof of the palace. They bring him edge, closer to the edge of the palace and they begin to sever his head off of his body. They throw the head of Muslim ibn Aqil off the palace, off the top of the palace of Ubaidullah ibn Ziyad. They throw his body off of the top of the palace and then we're told that they drag his body to the streets of Kufa, showing the people that any, res any rising up against the caliph of the time, to rise up against the leader, this is the outcome of you, that it's nothing but death and it's nothing but disgrace and dishonor within this dunya. وَسَيَعْلَمُ الَّذِينَ ذَلَمُ أَيَّ مُنْقَلِبٍ يَنْقَلِبُونَ إِنَّ لِلَّهِ وَإِنَّ إِلَيْهِ رَاجِعُونَ We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on this night where we're marking the shahadat of the first martyr of Karbala, Muslim ibn Aqil, that he gives us, first of all, the aljar and the reward of this majlis tonight. We ask Allah that we can be true followers of Muhammad and Ali Muhammad, that we can imbibe the traits to be a true Shia within our lives and that we do not leave this world except as followers of the Prophet and the ways of the Prophet. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta samiul alim. Salawat upon Muhammad and Ali Muhammad.